Goodness. Most of you know that he got into it with a van and the van lost. Or How long? Two weeks. Three weeks. Two weeks ago. Pulling out. Van pulled out in front of him. and Ouch. It's good to see you, man. Good to see you. Good to see all of you. Uh, keep praying for each other. Pray for each other. Pray for each other. Pray for each other. Pray for us. Pray for each other. Um, let's jump into it. What do you think I think? Is there anything to talk about? Somebody asked if my government shut down a long time ago. We don't care about it. Let them shut it down. I know that sounds easy because some there are people in positions where they're making decisions that it's of all the things that they are cutting back, they're cutting back on just the things that make one group look bad and make a handful of people feel bad. And, and it doesn't have to be. The things that they're stopping, they don't have to stop. They, they could... Anyway, that's a whole other thing. Vote for me for president. I'll fix it. I was thinking this morning I was shaving or combing both my hairs or something. Anyway, I was looking at myself in the mirror and thinking, okay, if I ran for president, I would, and I would, and I, I'd be shot before I, I thought about running for mayor of Roswell once. I never, did I ever tell you that, babe? <laughs> I used to have a lot of free time when she was working. <laughs> Well, she was working at the hospital in Roswell. I was going to run for mayor. <laughs> uh, obviously, that didn't get very far. Okay, what do you think about misinterpreting the Pope? Isn't that horrible when people misunderstand what the poor Papa? They shouldn't misunderstand the Pope. Now, what do you think I think about the Pope? Be nice. Don't get me arrested or in trouble. Or... Do I think we should be nice to the Pope? If the Pope walked in the door... You know, we've, we've had priests and, and nuns uh, attend services here before. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, they, they obviously didn't wear their garb. <laughs> but uh, uh, one, one, one particular priest and one particular nun uh, came and they were, they were doing a study kind of on, on why Catholics are leaving, uh, the Catholic, why people are leaving the Catholic Church. And uh, they came to talk to us because at that point, we, we started here with about 20 people. And in about a year, we had about 200 people. I don't know if those of you who were here in the beginning. And then the, the following year, people figured out how charismatic I was or wasn't, how Baptist I was or wasn't. And the first year, we grew from 20 to 200. And the next year, we grew from 200 all the way up to 120, something like that. And then we grow, and we're, we're, we're back at about, I think, weekly services, or what, 120, 130, something like that, with the, the two services together. Um, when Catholics come, how many of you were Catholic before? How many of you kind of charismatic Pentecostal before? Some of you, you same people raise their hands. <laughs> how many of you kind of Baptist before? Okay. Boy, that explains a lot. The, the people who give me the hardest time are all the Baptists. Huh? All, the, all the, what did my mom used to call me? Ma, malcriao, malcriao. What does that mean? Bad boy. Bad, <laughs> bad boy. Hi, mom, if you're watching. Um, we all have different backgrounds, right? Uh, even people who, who come out of Baptist churches, all Baptist churches aren't the same, right? Um, people believe different things fine. Uh, we approach the Bible different ways. We've been taught different things. Hopefully, we get a clue and grow beyond that. Whether you're coming out of a charismatic background, a Catholic background, a, a, a full-blown what you think is a Christian background, whatever you believe, you shouldn't stay there. A lot of people get upset with me and get, get, get hurt because they haven't figured out yet or they don't believe me and they, they just try to ignore the fact that the whole point of everything I do is to try to change you. And for most people, the whole point of their life is to not let anybody change them. You know what I mean? And that freaks people out, especially when they realize what I'm trying to do. But I've never kept it a secret. It's not like I'm trying to start a cult. I'm trying to change you. And it doesn't matter how godly you are. It doesn't matter how wicked you are. It doesn't matter if you're a flaming, oh, or I don't know what you think that was, by the way. <laughs> or just sold out, washed in the blood, you know, God talks to you every morning. It doesn't matter because we're still not in heaven. 
You're still not like Jesus. So wherever you are right here, you might be closer to God than I am. You might be more Christ-like than I am. But wherever you is, you ain't there yet, right? So we used to talk all the time, those of you who were here in the beginning, we used to talk about the God path, right? Figuring out where you are. Here's, here's Jesus, not me, but over here, okay? Here's, let's go in the other direction. Jerry, you can be Jesus again, okay? Because you're farthest back. It's going to be Enrico, but Jerry, you're behind him. All right, so Jerry is Jesus. Oh, it's Josh. Josh is Jesus. He stood up just so I could see him. Okay. Josh back there is Jesus. That's the goal. The goal is not to make you a good Baptist. The goal is not to, is, is not to unlearn you from whatever you had in the church before. Believe it or not, I'm not trying to unlearn you. I'm not trying to reprogram you, deprogram you. I'm, I'm not trying to do that. I am trying to change you. It doesn't matter what you believe. If you insist on staying, I don't care how Christ-like you are. I don't care how godly you are. I don't care how wicked you are. If you refuse to change from where you are, you are stunted in your spiritual growth. Right? I mean, duh. If the name of the game is not to be like Tony when you grow up, and that's okay with me. If the name of the game is to be like Josh when you grow up, who's Jesus right now? They'll get all happy. If the name of the game is to be like Jesus, you're somewhere along this God path. Somewhere. Wherever you are, you ain't there yet. Okay? My job under Jesus Christ is to help you get closer to Josh. By the way, you know, Jesus is the same name as Joshua. It is the same. It's cool, huh? He's the deliverer. Jehovah saves. Awesome. Awesome. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get you saved and then live like it. Okay? When I slam the Catholic Church, if you've been here long enough, you've heard me slam Charismatics, haven't you? Have you ever heard me slam Baptists? If you haven't, you are so not paying attention. I'm not trying to make you like me. I, I think I've got a pretty good shot ahead of most of y'all. Part of it is arrogance. Part, but maybe, a, maybe a little. <laughs> We're not voting. We're not voting. Part of it is arrogance. <laughs> I never heard her say amen before. <laughs> I, I never heard her say, I concur. <laughs> you didn't. Uh, part of it is, you know, I'm a little messed up. You got to be kind of messed up to go to the ministry. Uh, got to. Part of it is I, I, I really believe that God kind of does something in pastors' lives that's a little different. Not, not, not better. Just different. God uses sheep in a way that's a little different. He has different expectations for shepherds than he has for sheep. The goal is the same. Become like our great shepherd, in this case, Joshua, right? Jesus. That's the goal. But the Bible tells us, you know, it's not like he spoke to me. You know me. I, I've never heard God's voice. If I did, I didn't recognize it. If I did, I probably thought it was me. That's part of the ego arrogance thing. The Bible says that my job as a shepherd is to feed, lead, and protect the sheep so that you can, on your own, become like the shepherd, okay? I am trying to change you, absolutely. If you haven't figured that out yet, no wonder you're unhappy half the time with me. <laughs> I am trying to change you. If you think you're just solid, sold-out Baptist, I, just, I, I was just lucky, and I just grew up in the right church, and I, just, I had the right teachers. I went to the best Bible college and the best seminary that Baptist money can buy. If Jesus can't grow me beyond that stupidity, well, how weak is the Holy Spirit? The name of the game is to make me like Jesus, not the best Baptist preacher money can buy. You know what I mean? I made that up. I didn't spend that much money on my education, actually. That was a pretty good accent. Amen. Thank you very much. I'm not even sure how far south. I think it was more Juarez than Nashville. But, uh, okay, does that make sense? If, if, if you think that God has spoken to you and you think that, that you can speak to God, he can speak to you, okay, fine. I'm trying to get you to grow beyond that. If you think that what you learned in the Catholic Church is, you know, I, I'll believe that Jesus stuff, but, you know, I, uh, I'm trying to get you to grow beyond that. Because when we stand before Jesus Christ, he's not going to hold up Catholic dogma or the Baptist faith and message that comes out of Nashville. He, he's, he's not going to ask you how closely you adhere to 
uh, Calvary teaching or were you a good member at Legacy? Or none of that matters. Are you becoming more like Jesus? Does that make sense? All right. So when people uh, on, on, on all sides of the fence say we need to cut the Pope some slack because they're misunderstanding him. He's getting up and he's saying be nice and people think he's saying it's okay to be gay. It's okay to be an atheist. It's okay to this. It's okay to that. He hasn't said it's okay to be a Baptist yet. But everybody else is okay. And people on the liberal side of Catholicism say, ah, isn't that awesome? The Pope is growing. The Pope is changing. And they failed to hear the Pope when he says, well, that's not what he's saying. <laughs> I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what the Pope says. It doesn't matter if the Pope is for gays, against gays, for angels, for Baptists. It doesn't matter if the Pope thinks it's okay uh, that atheists can go to heaven. It doesn't matter that the Pope washed the feet of a Muslim teenager, uh, not a convert, but Muslim. None of that matters because the goal is not becoming like the Pope. The goal is becoming like Joshua. Okay, all you spiritual guys, right? That's the goal. Don't get hung up on Catholic teaching. Don't get hung up on Baptist teaching, whatever the heck that is. You know, by the way, there is no such thing as the Baptist church, just so you know that. There is no such thing as the Baptist church. There are Baptist churches. This is one. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I should have said it after church. I don't want you to leave until I'm through. But This is a Southern Baptist church. Basic. <laughs> that almost made me joke to hear you. <clears throat> what does that mean? Uh, it, mean it, it means a lot of things. Basically, it means that uh, just like Calvary Chapel is not a denomination, well, of course it is. They're not non-denominational. Calvary Chapel is a denomination. They are a denomination. Southern Baptist Church, uh, Southern Baptist Church is, I mean, the Southern Baptist Convention, it's a denomination. Basically, a denomination is a, you know, bring, bring these things that are different, try to find those things that are in common. The, uh, not necessarily the lowest common denominator, but try to find the similarities, and then we can fellowship together. It's a loose organization. It's not like in the Catholic Church or in a lot of Methodist churches where somebody from the top tells you what to believe, what you can teach. And Calvary, Chur uh, Calvary churches, as I understand it, are, are, are self-governing. They're autonomous, just like every Baptist church. They're self we're self-governing. Uh, no one from Nashville tells me what to preach. I don't have to pay union dues to stay in. Uh, they finally did wise up a few years ago and said, if you want to call yourself a Southern Baptist, which basically means that we believe the Bible, uh, we choose to identify with other Southern Baptists, which doesn't mean anything. It's like saying, I mean, I, I can say I, I identify with tall people. You can call yourself tall all you want, Tony, but, you know. But in, it, as, in Southern Baptist churches, I can say I'm Southern Baptist, and they'll just accept it. As long as what I adhere to when I say I believe the Bible is pretty close to what Baptists generally believe. You could be a charismatic Baptist. You could be crazy Baptist. I, I fit in there. It, it's really kind of, kind of loose. But, but there are some, you know, some non-negotiables. Jesus is God. There's only one way to heaven. That's through Jesus' death, burial, resurrection. You know, some, some of those. I believe the Bible. I identify with Southern Baptists. I choose to identify with Southern Baptists. I choose to do uh, some, not all, but some of my missions giving through the Southern Baptist Convention, meaning we cooperate with 40,000 other Southern Baptist churches in the States and 40,000 Southern Baptist ministries around the world, plus the 40,000 in the States. Well, you can get a lot more done when you're working with 80,000 groups versus just kind of on your own. You know, I just rent a storefront and just throw up a shingle and say, I'm having church. I mean, that's, that's, that's fine, I guess. Under God, if, if they're submitting to God, cool. That, does that kind of make sense? So to be a Southern Baptist basically means I believe the Bible. I choose to identify with Southern Baptist churches. I do some of my missions giving through the Southern Baptist Convention. And what was the last one that I said? I forgot. Was there a last one? Maybe that's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. And they have to approve. They have to vote me in. I think it's that way with Calvary churches. If you want to start a Calvary church, I think somebody's got to kind of give you permission before you call yourself Calvary Chapel and have a little dove and stuff, you know. I guess you can just bootleg a Calvary church, I guess. You know, I'm Calvary. He is not. Oh, I got the dove right there on the... I got it right there on the pulpit. Uh, so does that kind of make sense? It doesn't matter what the Pope says. It doesn't matter that I agree with some of the things in this newspaper article that the Pope said. That doesn't matter. I don't agree with it because the Pope said it. 
And I, well, I guess I agree with the Pope. No, I don't agree with the Pope. I don't. It doesn't matter if I disagree with the Pope. Because the goal is not the Pope. The goal is not what's taught in Baptist churches. The goal is not whatever you think God told you in a charismatic church. The goal is becoming like, wave at me, bud. Joshua. <laughs> Joshua. <laughs> You're going to get into heaven. Joshua. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Misinterpreting the Pope doesn't matter. Yeah. In your opinion, especially those of you that grew up Catholic, you know, actually from the outside, you could probably see more from the outside. Do you think most Catholics really care that much about what the Pope no. says? No. I didn't. I didn't even know what the Pope believed when I was a Catholic. Really? Is there something about authority that you? I, I have a ring. I just wanted to go. I don't know you wanted to kiss his ring. Really? Yeah. So you know. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I usually say that I'm not uh, uh, enamored by celebrity. I'm just intimidated by it, so I stay away from anyone's celebrity. But I, every time the, the president's plane would fly overhead, I, I'd, get on the, I'd literally get on the roof of my house. I'm just fascinated. I just, FBI, CIA, Secret Service, they all probably know my place because that's the guy that gets on the roof when the Air Force One goes by. Those of you who know I have a three-story back porch, the whole point of that was to be able to get on my roof and look at the lights in the city and the president's plane. The Pope flew over Albuquerque once. I was the same. You know what I believe about the Pope? You know what I believe? I don't know. This. I was on the roof of my house watching the Pope's plane go by thinking, he's in that thing right now. He's in that flying school bus right now. So, but in spite of that, don't be caught up with position anybody's respect authority this is kind of different i don't call a priest father i don't call a nun sister i mean i don't say hey betty you know <laughs> you know <laughs> or whatever you know I, you know i don't do that i don't try to be disrespectful but I, I think it's wrong i think it's wrong to give any credibility at all to false teachers i know that makes it tough because we all have family that are involved in churches that are, that are not Christian. Catholics think they're Christian or they don't? They think they are. And how horrible do I sound when I say they're not? But again, the goal is not what I believe. The goal is not what Baptists say. The goal is what does the Bible say? The Bible says a Christian is anyone who follows Jesus. Now, when I gave my life to the Lord, I became a Jesus follower. I became a Christian. I was still a Catholic. Uh, you've heard me say it. My membership is probably still at Ascension Catholic Church. I never took it out. I don't know how many Baptist preachers they have on the roll at Ascension Catholic Church, but I never took my membership out. But I don't want to identify with a false what church. The Baptists, they're, they're Baptists. They're good. Don't be messing with the Westboro Baptist people. What do you think about Westboro Baptists? Those are the guys who hold up the... They're horrible, awful people. And the fact that they're Baptists is just embarrassing. It is awful. I think we should go steal the copper from their church. <laughs> yeah, Westboro. You know who we're talking about? Westboro Baptist Church. They're the crazy guys from. I, I want to. They're not Virginia. They're. I don't know, but they. They. I don't know where they get this money, but they travel around the country and they. What's that? Yeah. Military funerals and. Yeah. You know, and you know what's really awful? I'm not being recorded now, right? I, I don't know that I don't disagree. I don't know that. <laughs> what does God say about homosexuality? He says it's wrong. What does he say about, he doesn't hate homosexuals. What does God say about guys sleeping with girls that they aren't married with? That's okay? No, he doesn't like that. It's sin. What does he think about, he doesn't hate them. Okay. What does he think about fibbers? Marcella? Oh, no, no, no. I didn't. <laughs> I just know you have answers. That's all. It wasn't because Orlando was going. <laughs> God hates lying. It's not a little white lie. It's a 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 lie. Right? Yeah, crazy. Westboro Baptist people, crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Baptist doesn't 
I mean, it, it, it used to kind of mean something, yeah. but it, it, I use it as a handle. You know, when Lauren brings me coffee, she turns it like that and gives me the handle. When I do get around to telling people I'm Baptist, Southern Baptist, it, it's really pretty much to give them a handle. It doesn't tell them precisely what I believe, but they figure I must be against sin. I must be a Bible thumper. You know, I, 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 I uh, believe in getting people saved, whatever they think that means. I want to throw them in the horse trough. Yep, got me. Want to take your money? Heck yeah. No. But it, again, it doesn't tell them precisely what I believe, but it, it, you know, they kind of get it. Baptists generally want to get everybody saved, want to throw them in the baptistry, uh, yeah. want them to, we've got a big old list of do's and don'ts. That's me. That's me. Right or wrong, that's me. Uh, so uh, it, it's good to have handles. It, it, it's, it tells people who you are as a family. I think you should never, ever, ever give credibility to a false religious organization. Never give credibility to a false teacher, ever. Even if they're running for president, that's tough. If they're in your family, man, love them. I mean, that's a good example. Love them, love them, love them. But try never, never, never to do anything that gives credibility to false teachers or false teaching. That's easier said than done. Now, when you decide to live for the Lord, you give your life to Jesus, you decide to live for the Lord, God protects you and nothing bad ever happens to you, right? Wrong? Wrong. Uh, just this morning, I think it was in uh, uh, Tennessee, a uh, church bus from um, uh, North Carolina, uh, I think, had 16 seniors uh, on a church outing uh, driving uh, through Tennessee. Uh, one of the tires on the bus blew. Uh, the bus overturned, went to the other side of the freeway, hit an SUV, an 18-wheeler hit them. And as I understand it, six of the 18 seniors from First Street Baptist, the uh, uh, city of North Carolina, was that Statesville? North Carolina. One of the three people in the SUV and the driver of the tractor trailer killed. Where was God? Now, now don't, don't throw anything at me. You know things happen. Things happen. Things happen. Uh, I understand there will be some people, some survivors from this, who will say, God, God protected me. Now, you know me, I'm so cynical, you know, God sent an angel to protect me. You know me, what's my question? Where the heck was the angel for the, yeah. Why didn't the angel keep the tire puffed up? Why didn't the, now, you know me, I, I believe all things work together for good. I trust God. It sounds so horribly insensitive. I, I trust God. I trust God. It's easy to say now I'm not one of the ones who lost a loved one. How horrible would I feel if, if I was, I'm driving the SUV and I was a little closer than I should have been, or, you know, there's always the what ifs, what ifs. How do you deal with God and tragedy? How are we supposed to deal with it? What was Greg supposed to do when he realized what was about to happen? You saw the whole thing, I guess, Greg, the, you remember the whole thing. What do you think? Now, if you watch as many movies as I do, I know he wouldn't. Just before, what, you don't say it, don't anybody say it. If you're watching movies, what is usually the last thing out of a person's mouth before the train wreck, before the plane crashes, before, oh my God. yeah, or, or worse, it's a cuss word. Is that the last word I want to come out of my mouth before I stand before my creator? Yeah. Um, most of the time, in this kind of a situation, you don't have enough time to kind of think, okay, all right, God, three minutes. This is, okay, this is what I want to tell you. Yeah. You're ready or you, you're not. Why doesn't God protect? Not enough faith? Greg didn't have enough faith. Is that it? No, no that's not it. Uh, he, hadn't, he, he didn't leave the house prayed up. Uh, sometimes things happen. Satan did it. We live in a sin-sick, sin-cursed world. Um, when I say sometimes things happen, I, I don't mean, you know, God just turns his back and, oh, darn it, you know. It's, it's, what I'm saying is actually worse than that. There is nothing that happens in our lives that God didn't either allow, this is going to sound horrible, or... There is no storm we go through that God either didn't allow you to go into or... What the heck? Why? 
Sunday morning, we reminded ourselves of it again. God is not as concerned about how comfortable we are in this life as he is about our conformity to him so that we're prepared for that life. Your best life, now I don't mean to keep slamming Joel, it's just that's a beautiful phrase to use. Your best life, Christian, is not now. Your best life is there. Was it Jesus who said, look, if this is all you have to look forward to, you might as well eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die, right? Then then this is your best life now. You don't want this to be your best life now. I pray for healing. I do. I've been known to bend my elbow when nobody's looking. I've touched the TV screen before. (laughs) Never spoke in tongues. I remember the first time I was in a church service where somebody spoke in tongues six inches from my head. A la modi. I'm okay with it now. I was at Legacy when it was Victory Love over here. I thought, I'm going to sneak into one of them services. I had just started pastoring. Huh? Rob was still like, hello, Friday! And I was hiding all secret, secret at Victory Love. And they were singing. I thought, this is safe because they're just singing. You know, there's no preaching going on right now. And a lady behind me started talking to Jesus. It wasn't Spanish. It wasn't Chinese. It was, I don't know what the heck. And I'm kind of making fun. Why did I even go there? (laughs) <laughs> I had extra. <laughs> ah. When tragedy happens, just be ready. Because it's going to happen. Your best life, it's there. Be prepared. Be prepared. Be prepared. Be prepared. I'm bending the arm, touching the TV, speaking in tongues. One thing I've never done. I pray... I pray for God to make it happen here. I mean, like, heal and supernatural, spectacular, like every other believer. God, the Holy Spirit, is at work doing supernatural works in your life, greater than happened during the time of Jesus, during his earthly walk. Greater than that, the Holy Spirit is doing today. But Jesus said, careful, because it's a wicked and, and, and adulter- uh, idolatrous uh, culture generation that's always looking for miracles, looking for miracles. Uh, Paul said in the last days, people are gullible, well-intentioned, but gullible people, spiritual people, spiritually sensitive people, they're going to be deceived by Satan with miracles, with the signs of the apostles. So just be careful. What do you do with God? What do you do with your belief when tragedy hits? Uh, Keep trusting God. It's easy for me to say. I hope I don't get practice anytime here soon. But when you do, you do. And you trust him and you pray and you hope you're surrounded by the best people in that situation. But you just, you just trust him. All right. We're going to be looking at a situation here. Hezekiah, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, H. Or Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a good king. There are only a couple of kings in Judah. Huh? He wasn't that bad. I, I could be like Hezekiah. Actually, there are parts of Hezekiah's life I'm already like, and you know, you know, we're looking at guys who do good and they did some bad. Yeah, Hezekiah was one of the the few kings in Judah that was considered a good king. All right, uh, remember here's Israel. You see it? Israel is what, like maybe uh, 60 miles wide, maybe, and I'm guessing what 120, 150 miles long, kind of, sorta, kind of looks like this. Yeah, it's got a ribbon of water going down the center, the Jordan River. In the center, you have the Sea of Galilee. Down at the bottom, you have the Dead Sea. Okay. Um, Jesus moved in, in different areas. Anybody need a Bible study guide, by the way? If you do, kind of slip your hand up and we'll get you one. Bible study guide, everybody have one? Um, Israel was under God. Uh, they, the, uh, the, uh, Abraham's family, this dude named Abraham, God spoke to him while he was still a heathen. He said, follow me. I want you to be my follower. Abe said, let's do this. And he became the father of many nations. So basically from Abraham and his old lady, literally, they had a kid, right? Isaac. And Abraham and Isaac had a kid and had a kid and they had a kid and they had grandkids. And that family became what we know today as the nation of Israel. All right. They were doing their thing and... Uh, there was a famine in the land, and so they ended up in Egypt because that was the only place that was food. I think God had other things in mind, but he allowed them to do it. They ended up becoming slaves to the Egyptians. 
After 400 years of slavery, God delivered them out of Egypt and they ended up back in the promised land, Canaan, which we know today is Israel, right? Um, they were there. God was blessing. God was using special uh, leaders, uh, judges, to, to, to lead them. And God was blessing them. God spoke to them. God protected them. God used them. And they said, you know what? We want to be like the other nations. We want to be different like everybody else. What do you mean? We want to have a king. And through the prophet, the Lord said, you've got me. And they said, no, that's good, but we want to like a real king. Like President Obama. God said, orale, choke on it. And he gave him a king who seemed pretty cool. Great speaker. Look, look, humble. Looked like he came out of nowhere. He did. Saul was nobody. Humble, shy. And he became their first king, and it went downhill from there. So you had King Saul, then you had King David, then his son King Solomon. After Solomon died, there were, there were a couple of sons in the mix, more than a couple, but there were a couple of sons in the mix who were in line to be king of Israel, right? And they ended up maybe making some kind of bad decisions, and the nation of Israel split. So there were basically 12 tribes, right, 12 families. The 10 tribes on the north kind of split off, and they called themselves Israel, and two tribes basically in the south called themselves Judah, okay? Israel in the north had a king, had kings. Judah in the south had kings. Most of the kings in Israel were sorry. They were awful, just awful, awful, just awful. The kings in Judah, they were not as awful. There were two kings in Judah that were pretty good, Josiah and Hezekiah. Good King Josiah, who started leading, ruling when he was like a baby. What was he, like six or seven or eight years old? He was just a baby. And Hezekiah, I think, started ruling when he was 25 years old. All right, as we're looking through this, we're going to fly through it. Three questions to ask yourself, okay? We're going to be talking about when we get to the end. How do you deal with idolatry in your own family? Whether under your own roof or people that you love, you know, your mom and dads or, or, or adult kids that you have in your family. When you know that they're worshiping false gods or, or uh, if, if you have my position that's so black and white, and I know life is not black and white, uh, you believe that the Catholic Church is leading people to, to, to the slavery of, of religion and they're going to end up in hell. I, I was Catholic when I got saved, but not because I was Catholic. It's because I started following the Bible. I've led a lot of Baptists to the Lord, so it, it's not what church you're in. You know what I mean? When there are people who are serving a false god, or even a god that's good enough, they're not actually serving that god, it's just enough God that they don't have to get the real God. You know what I mean? How do you deal with idolatry in your family? Two, how will you deal with death when you're staring it in the face? I mean, we're all going to die. But if you have the privilege of dealing with the moments before death or the minutes before death, or maybe the hours or days, how will you deal with death in your near future? And three, how might you deal with blessings in your hand? I don't know. Let's find out, God. We don't all handle blessings well. Or we might have more. I don't know what that sounded like. But God says if you're faithful in little, he'll make you ruler over much. Which is a horrible verse to remember when you're crazy like every other pastor and, and you know, you want to have 500,000 people showing up every Sunday morning. And you overlook the people that God has given you? Well, I, I don't think I do. But when you start looking at nickels and noses as a pastor or, or bodies, bucks, and bricks, you know, you start counting the success of your ministry in terms of how big is your building, how many people are coming, how much money is in the offering. You, you kind of missed it because the name of the game is become like... That's right. That's right. Yeah. Sorry. <coughs> okay. How do you deal with idolatry in your family? How will you deal with death in your near future? How might you deal with blessings in your hand? What do you do with that? Hezekiah, uh, depending on which baby name book you're reading, uh, Hezekiah basically means Jehovah is our confidence. I get my confidence from Jehovah, or Jehovah is strong, or Jehovah is strength. It's all kind of the same thing, depending on how you put the ideas together. Basically, you get Jehovah is strength, okay? He was the king of Judah uh, uh, between, uh, what, 715 uh, B.C. and 686, so a long time ago. Uh, Isaiah, uh, Hosea, 
Micah were prophets during the reign of uh, Hezekiah. Uh, it was during, again, you see Israel here? The ten tribes on the top were called what? Israel. The two tribes on the bottom were called Judah. The ten tribes of Israel went into captivity about 720, 721 B.C., about 700 years before Jesus. They went into captivity under the Assyrians. Sunday morning we talked about Jonah. God sent Jonah to Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. Jonah didn't want Assyria to get saved. He wanted them to be chamusca because he knew that Israel was probably in bad shape with God and Jonah knew that God tends to judge his people with heathen nations. You might want to tuck that away for future reference, America. And he didn't want Nineveh to be strong. He wanted Nineveh to be gone, right? Well, Assyria ended up destroying Israel took Israel into captivity. Well, uh, Hezekiah was a, a king of Judah during the time that Israel went into captivity. Does that make sense? Assyria also went after Judah, but he, he stood against that. And, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So you, you, Hezekiah is all over the Bible, but basically 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, and Isaiah is where we're going to get our, our big chunks for tonight. 2 Kings 18, 5 through 7 is basically a, uh, an epitaph. Did I say that right? I like words for your tombstone, huh? Hezekiah trusted in the Lord God Jehovah, the Lord God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him, for he claimed to the Lord, he stuck like glue, like ugly on a monkey, like white on rice. He claved to the Lord and departed not from following him. That's a pretty cool thing to have said about you by God. That's pretty cool. He stuck to God. And he kept God's commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with Hezekiah, and Hezekiah prospered wherever he went. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria and wouldn't serve him. He wouldn't serve an enemy king because it meant turning against the one true God. Okay? Hezekiah followed because of his faith. Um, that's the first point. He, he followed because of his faith. His actions revealed a, a good heart. Again, there's none that doeth good, no, not one. But, but there was something about Hezekiah's heart that, that he kind of leaned toward the Lord. Okay, He followed because he did what God said. I mean, that's what we just read. He did what he did because God had said what he said. That's what it means to live by faith. All right? Um, so where are we starting here with his family? Three big chunks, his family. His grandfather was good King Jotham of uh, Judah. Again, not, not one of the best kings, but a decent king. His, his grandfather was a decent king. His father was wicked. His father was Ahaz uh, of Judah, and he was, he was bad. Ahaz uh, nailed shut the doors of the church or the temple. He nailed the, the door shut, and he raised up false gods all over Israel. Uh, all over Judah, and he led the people to worship false gods. His dad was bad, not, not the good way, all right? His mother was Abby, the daughter of uh, Zechariah. Uh, we, we don't really know who this Zechariah was, or Abby, just the Bible just says uh, his mom's name. And his son was a king that was just as bad as the grandpa, I mean, as uh, his dad, right? So uh, there was a decent king who had a wicked son, who had a great king, who had an awful son, okay? Manasseh was horrible. He was a horrible king. Second Chronicles 28, verse 1. Ahaz was 20 years old. Now, Ahaz is the father of Hezekiah, the guy we're going to be looking at. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem 16 years. Unlike David, his, uh, uh, not father, but his ancestor, right? His father. Um, he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He followed the ways of the kings of Israel. Now, what did I say about the kings of Israel? Were they good or bad? They were bad. He, he, wanted to be, he wanted to be like an American president who wanted to be like the Europeans. That's exactly what he was doing. He wanted to be like the other guys instead of just following God and leading the people who were serving and following. I will serve President Obama. Have you seen those commercials with the celebrities? They're not just promising to be patriotic. They, they will serve President Barack Obama. What the heck is that all about? Judah should have followed God. Israel should have followed God. Hezekiah wanted to teach people to follow the Lord God. His daddy wanted them to follow the gods of Israel. Bad, 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 bad. 
He followed the ways of the kings of Israel, and so he also made idols for worshiping the Baals. The Baals were the false god statues uh, in Israel. He burned sacrifices in the valley of Ben Hinnom. Ben Hinnom, the valley of Hinnom, the sons of Hinnom, Ben his son, Hinnom, uh, Gehenna. Jesus said, Hell is like the garbage dump that the Hinnom brothers own. Ben Hinnom, the son of Hinnom. Uh, they, they, the fires never stopped because they were throwing dead bodies, criminals, uh, dead horses, dead goats, uh, your garbage. They threw it in the, in the arroyo that belonged on the property of the Hinnom family. And the fire just rose up forever. The smoke, just, it never stopped. Jesus said, hell is like that. All right. They burned sacrifices in the valley of Gehenna. You know what that means? They burned babies. They killed living babies alive by burning them as sacrifices. We don't do horrible things like that today. We just kill them while they're safe in their mother's womb. He burned sacrifices in the valley of ben Hinnom, and he sacrificed his own children in the fire. Hezekiah was one of the sons that lived. He wasn't aborted. Now, they didn't abort while the baby was still in the mama. They aborted after the baby was born. They would take it to Gehenna, to the valley of Hinnom, and they would take it to those giant wood stoves that was in the shape of a kind of a Buddha with arms out, you know, just a, a big god that was really a big wood stove. They'd stoke that fire red hot, and then they'd take a living baby and put it in the arms of the Baal, of Molech. Yeah? Ahaz did that, engaging in the detestable practices of the nations that the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He brought it back in. I thought we were through with that. He brought it back in. He offered sacrifices in verse 4. He burned incense at the high places, on the hilltops, and under every spreading tree. Therefore the Lord his God delivered him into the hands of the king of Aram. Now, the king of Judah became a slave to an enemy king, a false, worship, a false God-worshiping king. God often chastises his people under the hand of an unbeliever. He chastises his nations. I don't know that America's ever been a nation under God, but we were at least founded on biblical principles. The nation thinks we're a Christian nation. I mean, the world thinks we're a Christian nation, a la Modi. God often delivers up nations that are representing him into the hands of ungodly nations because we choose not to serve him. All right? And that's what happened to the king of Judah. The uh, Arameans defeated Ahaz and took away as many of his people as prisoners and brought them to Damascus, which is Syria today. He was also given into the hands of the king of Israel, who inflicted heavy casualties on him. In one day, verse 6, Pekah the son of Ramalia, Ramaliah killed 120,000 soldiers from Judah. Why? Because they'd forsaken the Lord, the God of their ancestors, because they were worshiping false gods. God let them be defeated in battle. That's the whole reason. You know, I tell you all the time, God doesn't want us to pray with other churches. I, it sounds horrible. Not the Christian churches, but even then, be careful. But God doesn't want you to pray with people who are not Christian. I, it sounds horrible. There's only one God, right? And then he hears everybody. It's not like he's, he's, only, he's got, you know, he's hard of hearing on the left side. And so, you know, he knows that Christians will be on the right side. Ah, it's not that. He chooses to ignore. But when we pray with people who are serving false gods, God listens and he gets mad. How stupid are you, believer? I, I can, if I hear God's voice, it's then. How dumb are you, Christians, that you don't know to stand against false teaching, not with them, right? And here's an example. They stood with false teachers and God killed 120,000 soldiers. Second Chronicles 29, Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. Okay, that was his family. His faith, when uh, Hezekiah became king, he removed idolatry that was set up by his dad Ahaz uh, when he was 25 years old. Uh, he charged the priest, he gave the responsibility to the priests and the Levites to clean out the temple. His daddy had nailed the doors shut. He said, take those pieces of plywood off the doors and the windows. Open this thing up, sweep it out, consecrate it to the Lord so that we can start worshiping here again. And he led a worship service that lasted at least two weeks, a Passover worship service. 
Sin offerings were made for the kingdom, for the sanctuary, for Judah, for Israel. He was a man of effective prayer. This king had a great relationship with a Billy Graham of his day. Actually better than a Billy Graham because Isaiah stood. He didn't compromise at all. He wasn't diplomatic. Isaiah just stood. And Isaiah was a statesman. Isaiah did stand before kings. But he stood black and white. He didn't stand, you know, well, you know. He wasn't a well, you know. He was a thus saith the Lord. I like him. I want to be just like him when I grow up. Um, where are we now? Second Kings 18, 3. Thank you. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father did. Now, how, how can you make sure that you're doing what's right in the eyes of the Lord? From this, from the Bible, not what you were taught in a Baptist church, not what you were taught in any other church. Grow beyond that. I'm not saying it was bad. I'm not saying it was worthless. I'm saying grow beyond that because the name of the game is become more like. Thank you. He removed the high places and he smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles. You know what that means? He burned. Don't do this. I'm being recorded. I'm telling you, don't do this. He literally went out and he burned down. It would be today like burning down Catholic churches, Mormon churches. He went into the Pueblo and he tore down everything that they were doing in their feast days. He did everything to show I'm standing against the, any religion, as good as they are, that's against this. And he literally tore down their, don't you do it. God has another way for us to do it. He literally went down and tore down the places of worship for every false god. Wow. Asherah poles. That's a totem pole. That's a, that's a, a stick that's been carved, that's been raised up. Well, it doesn't have to be carved, but it's raised up uh, for purposes of worship. It'd be like a saint in the Catholic Church, except it's a, a pole. It, it's there for worshiping false gods. Don't, don't, don't. Uh, where am I? 18.4, uh, he broke into pieces the bronze snake that Moses had made. Remember, the people turned away from God in the wilderness, and God sent poisonous snakes into the camp, and they were all starting to die. And Moses went to intervene for the people who were so hateful to him. He still held them up in prayer. God, don't hurt them. God, don't chamuska them. The, the Bible's going to say someday, touch not the Lord's anointed. They didn't mean it, Lord. They, they knew not what they did. How's my grammar? And so God said, make a brass snake. Make a snake made out of brass and put it on a stick, you know, kind of the medical symbol, kind of that. Put it in the middle of the camp and tell everybody, whoever looks at that snake, whoever looks will live. There was nothing magic about that piece of brass. It was Nehushtan, literally just a piece of brass. But they kept it around. This splinter came from the cross. Oh. This was John the Baptist's head. Really? All these relics in the Catholic Church that are fake anyway, but uh, even if it was John the Baptist's head, even if it was a real nail from the cross, even if it was a piece of the cross, don't worship it. In seminary, I got, he was gracious and gave me a D on a paper instead of an F because I said that Catholics worship Mary. In big old red letter, venerate. They venerate. They don't worship these relics. They venerate. Mm, Presbyterian professor. <laughs> Wasn't a Baptist. <laughs> I understand the distinction between veneration and worship. They were worshiping that thing. They were bowing down to it. They were, they, oh, it's just, a, it's just a help. It's a worship aid. It helps me work. Nah, you want to worship God? Worship God. You don't need the stick. You don't need the brass snake. So basically, uh, uh, Hezekiah took that brass snake and he beat it into powder. And I thought Moses is the one who made him drink it. But this says that he's the one who broke this thing up. So anyway, he broke the piece into pieces, the bronze snake that Moses had made. Uh, for up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. It was called Nehushtan. Uh, Hezekiah, again, just a piece of brass. Uh, Hezekiah uh, trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. 5B, there was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. That's, that's a pretty big thing for God to say. You're a pretty good king. There was nobody like you before or after. He held fast to the Lord, and he did not stop following God. He kept the commands that the Lord God had given Moses. That's cool. That's his faith, his fight. In Hezekiah's 14th year, King Shennacherib. Sennacherib of Assyria came into Judah and said, hey, uh, we want you to bow down to us. Um, now, uh, Shalmaneser had already beat up on Israel. 
uh, Hezekiah was the king of Judah in the south when uh, uh, Shalmaneser, the king of uh, Assyria, had come in and taken the ten tribes of Israel captive. He watched all that, like that, on TV. And then the king came and said, hey, bow down to us. Ah, uh, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you give us a lot of money? And it basically turned out to be like eight tons of silver and a ton of gold. Okay, let's do that. So he stripped the, temp the uh, palace treasuries. He tore gold off the temple. Uh, Hezekiah did to try to appease uh, Shal uh, Shalmaneser and later Sennacherib. Uh, Samaria, what am I saying? Shalmaneser had besieged Samaria and taken it eight years earlier. So before Sennacherib came to Judah and said, bow down to us, Eight years before, Israel had already fallen, okay? Um, Hezekiah submitted. He paid, oh, 100 tons of silver and a ton of gold. He, I could look at the slides ahead, but I'm barely a step ahead of you. If you read ahead, you're way ahead of me. He emptied the palace treasuries, stripped the gold off the temple door. So Necherib then demanded, okay, that was fine that you gave me that money, but I think I want a little bit more now. And he demanded complete surrender. Hezekiah tore his clothes. What is that, a sign of to tear your clothes? It means you don't fit in them? You can't take them off anymore? Morning, there you go. Sackcloth and ashes, right? They would tear their clothes. They would throw ashes or dirt on their head. Um, what is sackcloth? It, it's cloth that you make sacks out of, but literally, what is it? Burlap, gunny sack. Ow, itchy. Worse than an army blanket, whatever that's like. Uh, itchy. Hezekiah tore his clothes, wore sackcloth, went to the temple, sent for Isaiah. Uh, who's Isaiah? He's a preacher, right? Isaiah sent word back to Hezekiah. Listen, dude, it's going to be okay. Sennacherib sends defiant, threatening, ungodly letters into Judah. Hezekiah takes those letters. He goes back to the church. He goes back to the temple. He spreads them out before the Lord, and he cries out, and he prays. He sends for Isaiah, and Isaiah says, dude, it's going to be okay. Um, that night, the angel of the Lord, many believe is Jesus before uh, Bethlehem, the, the pre-incarnate Christ. But the angel of the Lord, now the Assyrians are all around Jerusalem. You surrender to us, or we will kill you. God, what are we going to do? Isaiah says, the Lord says, it's going to be fine. Okay. And that night, the angel of the Lord went into the enemy camp that was surrounding Jerusalem and killed 185,000 Assyrians. The angel of the Lord just went, just, just killed them. Well, guess who won that battle? Well, Judah did, yeah. Second Kings 19, 14, Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and he read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and he spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. Lord, the God of Israel enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your ears, Lord, and see. Listen to the words that Sennacherib has said, sent to ridicule the living God. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings laid waste these nations in their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them. The Assyrians were saying their God was stronger than the gods of the enemy nations. God Show them that you are the only real God. Because the Assyrian king has said, our God can beat up your God. And that's what his bumper sticker said on his truck. My God is bigger than your God. My God can beat up your God. And Hezekiah prays, God, show them that you're bigger than their gods. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord, in verse 19... Deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. Listen to me. If you're standing with false religious teachers, people in your family who are involved in ungodly churches, false, following false gods, how can you ever proclaim anything like that? You have to stand against. I mean, you don't have to. I'm not the boss of you. If that's clear, I am not the boss of you. But I'm telling you, they're not going to hear you say this if you don't stand like this. But how are you going to come off? Just mean as a Westboro Baptist member. I don't agree with them. But if what they're saying is true, I'm not saying it is. That's hard. I'm not saying it is. I'm saying don't stand with them because... They're, they are Westboro Baptists. Or sta don't stand against them just because they are Westboro Baptists. You stand with this because you want to become more like, that's right. 
It doesn't matter what you learned in your other church. It doesn't matter what you learned here, if you got anything here. It doesn't matter because I'm trying to do what to you? I'm trying to inflict change upon you. I want to I want to I want to make you miserable if necessary or comfortable if necessary. Whatever it takes to get you to move from where you are a little bit closer to Joshua, a little bit closer to Jesus. It doesn't matter how godly you are. It doesn't matter how right you are. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how well the other thing you are. I want to move you a little bit closer. But I want I want to show you and help you and I'm not always doing a great job. I want you to decide. I want to get a little bit closer. I want you to decide. I want to get a little bit closer. No matter how godly you are, I want to move you from that position. Does that make sense? So don't shy away from crazy people if they say something right. But then again, don't stand with the crazy people. Stand with him. Don't agree with something just because you're comfortable with the church you were in or the people who were teaching it. Because it's here. Now, Lord God, deliver us from his hands so that all the world may know that you alone, Lord, are God. You alone, you're the only one. You're the only God. You're the only God. You're the only God, only God, only God. Have I said that? You're the only God. If you don't live like it, they're never going to hear you when you say it. Now, you may be too nice to want to say it like I say it. Cool. Look for a nice way to say it. But sooner or later, you're going to sound kind of rough, kind of exclusive. That's why the Christian God isn't welcome in the world. Because your God doesn't play fair with the other pretend gods. Your God says, I don't have to share. There are no... What do you mean? What's the movie with the grandparents and the parents and the guy's got a, an imaginary kangaroo or... All the other gods of the world are imaginary kangaroos. You don't have to be nice and pretend, oh, come on, Squirrely, or whatever the name of the kangaroo was. You don't have to be nice and pretend that there's a pretend kangaroo there. There is no other kangaroo in the room. Jesus Christ is God. He's Lord. He's the only Lord. You don't have to be nice to the priest. Don't be mean to him. But don't hold him up like he's somebody. He's just deluded in a dress. Sorry. <laughs> Couldn't help it. He's deluded. And if you run across a Baptist preacher who doesn't follow this, he's messed up too. Doesn't matter what church. I'm not standing against a Catholic church. I'm teaching against false doctrine. And if you find false doctrine in a Baptist church, it's still wrong. This is what you follow because I want to change you. Actually, I'm not trying to change you. I want to encourage you to change so that you become more like. That's right. And it doesn't matter where you are. You can get a little bit closer and a little bit closer and a little bit closer. We want them to know you're the only God. 32, therefore, this is what the Lord says concerning the king of Assyria. He will not enter this city. Don't worry. He won't even shoot an arrow over the fence here the fence, the wall. He will not come before it with shield. He won't build a siege ramp against it. 33, by the way that he came, he will return. He will not enter this city, declares the Lord. I will defend this city. I will save it for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. 35, that night the angel, that night, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. My goodness, the battle is the Lord's. Even the battles you fight, even the battles you fight. So what does that say when it looks like you're losing? I don't know. But the battle's not yours, it's the Lord's. I'm not saying just roll over and pee on yourself. I, I mean, <laughs> use your head. Use your head. But the, but, the, but, the, but the victory is not dependent on how smart you are. The victory is not dependent on how shrewd you are. The victory is not dependent on how good your lawyer is. The victory is not dependent on how mm, you are in the argument. Mm, that's me. It doesn't, it, it doesn't depend on that. It doesn't depend on how much muscle you have, how much money you have to stand against it. It doesn't matter how, much, how, how good the doctor is. It, it, none of the, I mean, I hope you have good doctors. I hope you have lots of money. I hope you have a great lawyer. You know, I, but the battle is the Lord's because the name of the game is not comfort in this life. The name of the game is become more like Jesus, Joshua. And if that's the storm that it takes to get you closer, man, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I am. I'm sorry. God gave me you. <laughs> I mean, you think you've got it bad. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> God knows what it's going to take. I, I, I know that sounds horrible. God knows what it takes. To God be the glory, man. You just, 
I know it sounds awful, but there's a, I'm sure there's a, a more appropriate biblical phrase, but suck it up and deal with it. I know it sounds horrible. I don't know what you've got to win. I don't know what you have to lose. I just know that Jesus knew what he was talking about when he said, if you're going to be my disciple, you're going to have to die to yourself. That means sometimes, it doesn't mean roll over and pee on yourself, but sometimes it's just not going to look like you win. But if you become more like Jesus, to God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son who yielded his life in atonement for sin, <laughs> who opened the life gates that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. <laughs> God's good. God's good. He's just, he's God. He's God. I'm sorry that life is tough. I really am. I really, I really feel bad. I feel bad that some of you guys are dealing with some of the stuff you're dealing with. And I wish I could do more. I pray for you. Shoot, if I thought it would help, I'd lay hands on you. I would, you know, I'll kiss you. I won't kiss you. I'll do, you know, whatever it is to make you feel better. But like we talk about Sunday morning, to encourage you the Bible way, to parakaleo, to actually come alongside to encourage, doesn't necessarily mean to make you feel better. The Bible means come alongside you and help you be better. That means no matter where you are, encourage you to get a little bit closer to Joshua. God, help us be more like Hezekiah. He wanted to be more like you. He got closer to you, closer and closer and closer. He still messed up. He still messed up. But God, you were able to say about him, he was a good king. He was a good man. He was a godly man. God, I want that to be said about me. I want that to be said about the people here. God, help us stand for you. Wherever you lead us, wherever you have us, God, help us stand for you. The pressure is unbelievable. The pressure that some of these guys are under is unbelievable. God, we trust you. Jesus, we want to cooperate with you. Spirit of God, we want to cooperate with you as you're moving us just a little bit closer to conformity to Jesus Christ. Whatever it takes, God, be gentle. Oh, God, be gentle. God, please heal. Man, you know what some of the guys are dealing with here. God, please heal. Please restore. Please strengthen. Please cheer up. Embolden. God, I, I do want the people that you've allowed me to pray for, to be a part of the same family. God, I, I do want them to feel better. I really do. But God, I know that the name of the game is to be better, to become more like you. Please be gentle, but be firm. God, please let it happen here. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Next week, we'll get into the Bible study. <laughs> <laughs>